At competing rallies in El Paso, Texas, President Trump rhetorically gelds poor Beto O'Rourke. And the president is continuing to cut down his opponents as Democrats scramble after a particularly disastrous week. What a time to be alive, and the 2020 race has just barely begun. Then, do animals feel pain? And finally, on this day in history, Reverend Henry Highland Garnett becomes the first black man to address the U.S. Congress. We will remember his excellent sermon. I'm Michael Knowles, and this is The Michael Knowles Show. So much to get to today. I wasn't supposed to be with you all today. I was actually supposed to be on the road, but I was able to come back here to LA. So I'm very glad because there is so much to get to. I was in my hotel room in Atlanta last night. I was about to go to bed. We had a great time at Emory University and I came back and I turned on the TV and there was President Trump giving his El Paso speech, his El Paso rally, his El Paso wall rally. It was so good. And I just thought, man, this guy is really good at politics. Then down the road, poor little Beto could barely get anything going on. He could barely be heard over the sound of Trump's superior rally going on a quarter of a mile away. We will get to that in a second. But first, let's make a little money, honey, with Purple Mattress. Purple Mattress is tremendous. You know this. I am a... An, evangelist of purple. I'm a proselytizer of purple. It is the best bed that I've ever slept on. Purple mattress is not an inner spring. It's not exactly a memory foam. It's this new technology. It was developed by a rocket scientist and it is both firm and soft at the same time. How is that possible? I couldn't possibly tell you. It just feels great. I miss it every time I'm on the road. I love it. I've been recommending it to all of my friends. You should check it out. A purple mattress also it will sleep cool. It sometimes beds just get really, really hot even in winter. Purple mattress doesn't trap the heat like that. You'll just love it. 100 night risk free trial if you're not fully satisfied. You can return your mattress for a full refund. Backed by 10 year warranty, free shipping and returns, free in home setup, and old mattress for removal. You will love it. Right now, my listeners will get a free purple pillow with the purchase of a mattress. That's in addition to the great free gifts they're offering site-wide. Just text COFEFE, C-O-V-F-E-F-E to 474747. That is the only way to get this free pillow. Text COFEFE right now. Do it. C-O-V-F-E-F-E to 474747. C-O-V-F-E-F-E 474747. Message and data rates may apply. This Trump rally was so good. If you missed it, go back and watch the whole thing afterward. He went on for over an hour. The man has such stamina. He both had a speech. He was reading in parts from a prompter, and then he would just go off on these Trumpian riffs that were so effective. My main takeaway from it was that this guy is so surprisingly good at politics. We should not be surprised by this anymore. He's a, people were tweeting, they said, oh, you know, he really is likable. Oh, he really is somewhat charming. And you think, oh, the guy who was a celebrity for 40 years and then the king of television and then got himself elected to the most important political office in the world on his first try, that guy might be a little charming. I think he is. I think he's slightly charming. You just forget it sometimes. You forget it because the media tell you that he's some bumbling idiot who doesn't know anything about politics. He's never even heard of I don't know, energy policy. He doesn't even, what is the Congress? He doesn't even know what the Congress is. He's just a big bumbling fool who accidentally keeps finding himself in these incredible situations. He's the Ferris Bueller of uh, politicians, I guess. You can tell he's really good at, at this political rally game, and you can tell he's getting even better at it. Here is the message that President Trump has found in recent weeks, and he really needs to hammer home. All Republicans should be hammering home on the wall. This one cuts through all of the noise. The biggest proponents of open borders are rich liberals and wealthy donors. These are hypocrites who oppose security for you while living their entire lives. I do, too, to be honest with you. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I also live behind walls, okay? They live behind walls and gates and they have guards all over the place. Me too, because I want to be safe and I want to make America safe, if you don't mind. What a great line of attack. This is a very Trumpian setup. This is one of the great setups that helped him in 2016, which is you call out hypocrisy, you call out corruption, Then you say that you also participated in that. 
you also participated in this elitism. And then you say, I see it clearly and I want everyone to enjoy the fruits of elitism. I want everyone to be able to live like I do. It's an essentially American message. It sort of grants a little bit of a vice or it's, it's like he's letting you in on a little secret, even though it's not a secret. We all know Donald Trump lived behind walls because he's a, a billionaire. Uh, but it's, it's allowing that connection. It's saying, hey, psst, come here. I got something to tell you. It's rhetorically extraordinarily effective. Uh, you saw him do this in 2016. He said, look, I don't need to take anybody's money. I don't need to take money from any of the big donors. Me, I was buying off politicians left and right when I was a developer in New York. Oh yeah, I was buying them all off. Democrats, Republicans, everybody. And I'm telling you, I've seen how it works. I've seen it up close and I'm not going to be that guy for you. I don't need their money. I'm letting you in on the secret. I participated in that and it's wrong because some people got to do it and some people don't. It granted access to some people, but not others. And I'm telling you now, I'm going to clean up government. I'm going to drain the swamp. Rhetorically, very effective. He's doing the same thing here. He's saying the people who oppose the wall all live behind walls. This is true 100% of the time. Some live behind really big, giant, gated (laughs) mansions like Nancy Pelosi, but everybody's got walls. Everybody's got a lock on their door. Everybody's got walls in their house. And these members of Congress, many of them have security. They travel with security. They travel with guys with guns. It's just you who doesn't get to have them. And he's saying, I want to give that to everybody. I want everybody to be just as safe as these hypocrite Democrat billionaires and these donors and these members of Congress. He's not even just zeroing in on the Democrats because there are donors in both parties. This this was always the unholy alliance that gave us illegal immigration, is that Democrats wanted to import them for votes and uh, the sort of Wall Street Journal Republican set, the Chamber of Commerce Republican set, wanted to import them for cheap labor so they both would turn a blind eye and in some cases even encourage illegal immigration. Donald Trump's going in and saying, yep, that's a crooked deal, that's a raw deal, they're hypocrites. They're enjoying the fruits of security. You should too. This works for the gun control argument as well. So these guys are hypocrites. They've got armed guards with them at all times. You should be able to be an armed guard for yourself. And you should be able to give your family an armed guard in yourself. You should be able to carry your guns. And I'm going to do that. And it's a totally American message because instead of just tearing down the elite, saying, you billionaires are immoral, like AOC just said, or people who have succeeded are terrible. We should tear them down. That's a very un-American message. Donald Trump gives the American message. He says, yeah, I was buying off politicians left and right, and I'm going to be, I'm going to be buying off myself for you. I'm going to be giving you the opportunity. You can buy me off with your votes. I'm unaccountable to all. You, I'm going to be influenced not by special interests, but by you, the American people. Yeah, I've been living behind gates my whole life, and, I, and I'm going to extend that to you so that you can live like the elites. Yeah, the elites get to be behind the protection of armed guards all the time. I'm going to extend that to you. You can live like the elites. A totally uplifting message. And the, the other advantage for him is there's no actual argument against the wall. So he's pushing really hard right now. He took a little bit of a personal popularity hit during that government shutdown. And since then, though, his popularity has really increased and he is going hard at these people. So Beto O'Rourke held a rally down the street. A tale of two rallies. You know, everybody tells me that Beto is a great politician. I've never met Beto in person. I've never seen him personally on the stump or on the campaign trail. But people who were, people who were advisors to Senator Cruz and others who saw him up close, they tell me he's a great politician. However, the more light that is being shown on this guy, the less talented he seems. Take a look at this. In one of the safest cities in the United States of America, Safe, not because of walls, but in spite of walls. Secure, because we treat one another with dignity and respect. That is the way that we make our communities and our country safe. Ugh. Oh. Beto O'Rourke. Women don't want him. Men don't want to be him. How awkward. 
First of all, if you couldn't see it, his body movements are so awkward and stilted. You've got Donald Trump behind his podium and he's, he's got, he also gesticulates, but it, it doesn't seem to be gesticulation. It seems that he, he has a purpose behind his movements. Whereas when you look at Beto, he's a cool guy. You know, Beto, he's so cool and modern. He doesn't need a jacket. Yeah, dad, you can't make me wear a tie, dad. Oh, I'm cool. He's just doing that Obama thing, you know. He's actually doing what I'm wearing right now, except I'm doing a podcast. He's giving a political rally to all of his supporters. He can't, no, I can't be bothered to wear a jacket. I'm a cool guy. Mm-mm-mm. He, so he's doing that. I don't need a podium, Dad. Mm. So then he's just walking around the stage. and But he's it's too awkward. Like his torso isn't working. I, I don't want people to accuse me, by the way, of sexism because I keep commenting on these female Democrat presidential candidates on how they are coming across physically. Uh, I've all, well, I will also do it for the male candidates. The trouble is that all of the candidates right now are women. Right? I think all of the Democrat candidates, Amy Klobuchar, uh, Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, they're, I, it's only declared women right now in the Democrat field. So when, when men declare, like when Beto finally comes out and runs, I can point to that as well. Uh, but Beto O'Rourke is, he's just, he's, he reminds me of that guy in college, that creepy guy in college who would go up to your girlfriend and tell them that like he's really way more sensitive than your boyfriend is. You know, like he's that guy. He's that creepy male feminist who writes diary entries on Medium. He just do- he did not come off well in this rally. It, but but look at this difference. Just look at this difference between in one second. There's a huge difference. You can tell the big difference between the Trump rally and the Beto rally in one second. First, let's make a little money, honey, with We the People holsters. Oh, I love We The People holsters. They design everything in-house. We The People holsters offer custom-made holsters, all produced in the USA. They design them in-house. That means they don't use any third-party models for their holsters. Instead, every unique mold comes out of Las Vegas in order to best fit each and every firearm perfectly. They're constantly updating their designs, adding new designs every month, lets them stay up to date on the newest models that come out. We The People holsters even have their own 3D design team that measures every micromillimeter of their guns to ensure the perfect fit. Their unique and intuitive clip design allows for you to easily adjust both the cant and ride of your holster so that it will fit comfortably and securely at all times. You are able to place the holster on your waist, uh, on your, right on your waistband. You can change the angle. It's really good. Um, it's got adjustable retention. It's signaled with a click sound. This lets you know your firearm is securely in place. Don't cheap out when you're when it comes to your protection, when it comes to uh, your holster. Get uh, get a really high quality holster that is custom designed. It's going to fit your firearm. And by the way, you can get them at We The People Holsters. They start at just $37 a piece. And they have really cool designs. Thin blue line, constitution, camo, American flag. They're really cool. Every holster comes with a lifetime guarantee. Every holster ships free. If it's not a perfect fit, send it back for a refund. Check it out right now. Listeners of The Michael Knowles Show <clears throat> can go to we the people holsters.com slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, promo code Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S. At checkout, get $10 off your first holster. That's as low as $37. Shipping is free. Additional $10 off using that promo code. WeThePeopleHolsters.com slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, promo code Knowles at checkout for $10 off. Here is the difference between the Trump rally and the Beto rally in just one clip, back to back. First, you're going to see the Trump rally, and then immediately you will see the Beto rally. See if you can tell the difference. Where the action is. (laughs) (laughs) Could you tell the difference? It was a subtle difference, wasn't it? I think uh, that, by the way, I'm not making that up. That I know that seems like just the sort of joke I would say that the Trump rally had people chanting USA, USA, and then the Beto rally was a mariachi band. No, no, <laughs> no, no. It, they actually chanted USA at the Trump rally, and they actually had a mariachi band at the Beto rally. Uh, they're also obviously showing the difference between the GOP and the Democrats these days. The GOP, 
the GOP broadly, I think, always positioned itself as the pro-America party and the Democrats, at least since the 60s, have been the anti-America party. But at least the Democrats tried to hide it. They're not really hiding it anymore. They're not doing a very good job at it. They're now saying one party, the Republicans, want America to be a country and to remain a country because we like our country and our countrymen. And then the Democrats are saying, bring in the mariachis. Anything that looks American, get it out of here. We want totally open borders. We're ashamed that America exists. It shouldn't exist. And it won't exist for very long if we have anything to say about it. Uh, This also gets to a personal difference between both Donald Trump and Beto O'Rourke. Beto O'Rourke is a fraud. His name is a fraud. He pretends to be Mexican. He has this name Beto, Beto, but he's fully Irish. He's the most Irish. He's more Irish than Liz Warren is not Indian. And it's kind of a, this is a weird moment for the Democrats that you've got these racial frauds littering their presidential primary. But of course, the reason for this is because they've embraced an identity politics and an ideology called intersectionality that says that white people are bad. And if white people are bad, then these cynical politicians are going to pretend not to be white people like Beto O'Rourke. So you've got Beto, who's a race fraud. And then you've got President Trump, who is not a fraud. President Trump is many things. And you can accuse him of a great many things. But Donald Trump, what you see is what you get. That guy does not, there is not a lot of distance between him and the voter. Donald Trump, in this rally last night, Donald Trump is so authentic that he actually came out against puppies. He came out, he had been talking about German shepherds. This is the setup. He was talking about how at the border, they have all of this really cool technology to find drugs. And he said, but none of it's as effective as a German shepherd. They bring the drug dogs around and then the drug dogs sniff out the drugs. And then he goes on this rant. He's so authentic that he came out against puppies. You do love your dogs, don't you? I wouldn't mind having one, honestly, but I don't have any time. I don't have. How would I look walking a dog on the White House lawn? Would that be? Right? Sort of not for, I don't know. It doesn't, I don't feel good. Feels a little phony, phony to me. A lot of people say, oh, you should get a dog. Why? It's good politically. I said, look, that's not the relationship I have with my people. We want to have, yeah. Obama had a dog, you're right. (laughs) He nails it here. I found this clip so charming because he says, he's talking about dogs and all these people, I guess, really like their dogs. I mean, who doesn't like dogs? Dogs are man's best friend. He says, oh, you all love your dogs, right? Yeah, we love our dogs. Yeah, yeah, maybe should I get a dog? I don't have time for a dog. He's right. He doesn't have time for a dog. Yeah, well... What should I? Should I walk around with a little dog? Yeah, you should walk around with a dog. Nah, it would be phony. I don't want a dog. Nah, but it would be good politics. That's not the relationship I have with my people. And he's right. That's the thing. And then he laughs at that joke at the end. Yeah, Obama had a dog. All right, no dogs. Other politicians do things so that they can get a photo taken in the newspaper that they think will test really well in the focus groups with their supporters and the moderates. And, oh, mate, Mr. You should get a dog. Okay, I'll get a dog. I'll get a dog and I'll name it after me. Do you remember that Barack Obama named his dog after himself? Because he's a ridiculous narcissist. People call Trump a narcissist. Give me a, Barack Obama named the dog after him. So I'll get a dog. I'll look really good. Yep, love my dog. But Donald Trump is like me. I, I'm sorry. This is another, this is unpopular, but hey, that's my relationship to you, huh? Just like the president. I don't, I don't like dogs. I'm not a dog person. I'm not a cat person. I, I'm a people person is what I am. I like people. I'm not a huge, I just don't, I like dogs for five minutes. And I, if I go to my friend's house, I can play with the dog and then go away, go, because dogs are not reasonable. I can't reason with them. So after a while, I say, okay, that's fine. I don't want to have to stay home and walk them. I don't want to have to. Now in L.A., because the dogs have taken over the whole city, now the dogs own people in L.A. So when you go to restaurants, it's just all these dogs, and they're all pretend service animals for, like, little 17-year-old white girls who can't go anywhere without Fluffy. And they they completely take... But I don't care. I don't... I'm with Donald Trump. I don't have time. I'm not that interested. Sorry. 
Now, most politicians would never say that. How do you, it's like coming out against apple pie. Say, yeah, I don't like apple pie. I'm not an apple pie person. Nope. Uh Uh-uh. And, but he does it because he knows, look, I'm not going to do some stupid photo op for so that there's a photo in the New York Times and then people think I'm really soft and warm because I have a dog. I'm not doing that. I'm speaking very candidly to the American people and to my supporters. And it works. It totally works. So this rally, this was a really nice way to end the my trip on the road. I had been on the road in Raleigh, North, Raleigh, North Carolina. I was in Atlanta. I was supposed to go to Alabama, but ended up coming straight back. I'd been sick. It had been a really tough week. I was pretty run down. And I see this and it totally reinvigorated me. And I think it totally reinvigorated his base. And Donald Trump is now on the war path. He is going hard. His, his approval rating is going up. And so now he's, he's going hard, not just against Beto, who he was ruthlessly mocking during the rally, but now he's going after Democrat freshman rep Ilan Omar. She's the one who said that Israel had hypnotized the world and we need to pray to Allah that people's eyes are opened to the evil of Israel. You know, a moderate. She was a moderate Democrat. And so then she came out and said that Jews are just buying off all of the Republicans. All those awful, terrible Jews are just buying them off with their money. And she tweeted out this, how come Republicans support Israel? She said, it's all about the Benjamins, baby, which is also a play on words because Benjamin is a Jewish name. And uh, she's referring to APAC, the Israel PAC in America, as if to say the only reason that anybody would ever support Israel is because they're on the hook for Jew money. That's her line. That's her point. She's obviously not a huge fan of the Jewish people or the state of Israel. And she just keeps doubling down in tweet and statement, all of these digs against Jews. And this has become too much for some members of her party, though her party has been pretty silent on anti-Semitism. Donald Trump feeling strong, coming off a good rally. He's coming out and says she she should resign. One other thing I might want to say is that anti-Semitism has no place in the United States Congress. And Congressman Omar is terrible, what she said. And I think she should either resign from Congress or she should certainly resign from the House Foreign Affairs Committee. What she said is so deep-seated in her heart that her lame apology, and that's what it was, it was lame, and she didn't mean a word of it, uh, was just not appropriate. I think she should resign from Congress, frankly. But at a minimum, she shouldn't be on committees, or certainly that committee. Beautiful, just coming out, kicking the Democrats while they're down. It's been a very tough couple weeks for Democrats. They've had the Green New Deal, which totally blew up in their face. They've got, you know, Eva Braun as a freshman Democrat Congress. They have a few Eva Brauns, actually, as a matter of fact, because they've got Uh, In the old days, anti-Semitism was mostly a right-wing issue. Obviously, it goes around a little bit, but it was mostly a right-wing issue. They they used to say that anti-Catholicism was the anti-Semitism of the left. Now, anti-Semitism is the anti-Semitism of the left. Uh, The left keeps trying to portray Donald Trump as a Nazi. They've been doing this now forever. They always do this to Republicans. Every Republican president is Hitler. They did it to Reagan. They did it to Bush. Uh, they're doing it to to Trump now. Uh, and so I think Trump was smart to seize on this moment and to really go after this uh, freshman congresswoman. Uh, let's put this into perspective. The state of Israel has named a train station in Jerusalem after Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the only president who has actually kept his promise, though many, many other presidents have promised it, he moved the embassy in Israel to Jerusalem, kept his promise. He has conservative and Orthodox Jews as senior advisors. His daughter converted to Judaism. It's very difficult to make the case that Donald Trump is anti-Semitic. Meanwhile, Democrats just elected their new stars to Congress, Ilan Omar, praying that Allah open people's eyes to the evils of Israel. Rashida Tlaib, who in her office actually took Israel off the map of the world and replaced it with a sticky note that said Palestine. 
palling around with anti-Semites. Barack Obama palling around with Louis Farrakhan, who calls the Jews termites. And they don't get held to account for it because of the mainstream media. So Donald Trump on the warpath is using his microphone to do it. And anti-Semitism now is primarily a left-wing problem. And he is really putting the focus on that. Absolutely, he, this is what he should be doing. It's only going to cause his approval rating to keep going up. It's at, what, 52%. It's going to keep going up if, if he keeps this up and the Democrats keep imploding. He's not the only one on the warpath. Cocaine Mitch pulled the best move that he has pulled since the Kavanaugh hearings. We'll get to that in a second. Plus a lot more to get to. Uh, we've got to get to Kamala Harris smoking pot. Uh, but first, you've got to go to dailywire.com. If you're there, thank you very much. You keep the lights on. You keep Kofefe in my cup. If you are not there, please check it out. It costs 10 bucks a month, $100 for an annual membership. You get me, you get the Andrew Clavin Show, you get the Ben Shapiro Show, you get the Matt Walsh Show, you get to ask questions in the mailbag that's coming up on Thursday. You get to ask questions backstage. We're like doing those every day now, practically. You get to get another kingdom. But most importantly of all, the leftist tears tumbler. You get, mmm. This is really good because, you know, Ilan Omar is praying that Allah open people's eyes up. And when, when those eyes are opened, especially those left-wing eyes, you know what's going to pour out? Those leftist tears because Donald Trump's approval rating is at 52%. And Beta O'Rourke had a flop of a rally last night. And Kamala Harris is boasting about how she smoked pot listening to Snoop Dogg seven years before his first album came out. Oh, it's just so... Oh, if I were on the left, I would fill up tumbler after tumbler this week. But I can't. I'm just filling them up with tears of joy. I'm just that, uh, that most popular emoji in the world. You know, the one where it's just, ha, ah, and then the tears of joy come pouring out. Uh, mix them in with your leftist tears, the tears of joy. And the leftist tears, it creates a, like a nice rosé. Serves really well out of your tumbler. Go to dailywire.com. We'll be right back. So Cocaine Mitch wants to join in on the fun. You know, Cocaine Mitch isn't going to let President Trump have all the fun. Oh, no, no, no. Cocaine Mitch. But what he does, they have very different styles. President Trump, obviously, he's a little bigger, more braggadocious, a little more, he's just a bigger personality. Cocaine Mitch, he just waits there in his shell. He's just spying around the room in his shell waiting for the opening to come out and snap. And he's found it in the Green New Deal. You remember the Green New Deal. It's going to destroy 88% of American energy, knock down every single building in the country, rebuild it within 10 years, outlaw airplanes, outlaw automobiles. Obviously, you're going to have to leave your home when they knock the building down. Uh, It's going to destroy one-sixth of the American economy, institute socialist health care, take away unemployment insurance, create mandatory government jobs, I guess. That's the backstop. Uh, Then it's going to pay people who are unwilling to work. The list goes on and on and on and on. And do you know who loves the Green New Deal other than all of us? Cocaine Mitch. Oh, he loves it. Cocaine Mitch is going to bring the Green New Deal to the Senate floor for a vote. Now, obviously, it's not going to pass the Senate. Uh, There are There is Republican control of the Senate, and President Trump would veto it anyway. But what Cocaine Mitch wants to do, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Senate Majority Leader Cocaine, what Senate Majority Leader Cocaine wants to do is get every single Democrat senator on the record as either supporting or opposing the Green New Deal. This is a perfect wedge issue, especially because environmentalism is the left's religion. So if you oppose it, you're not just opposing some policy they like. You are opposing their faith, their creed, the heart of their identity. And he wants to get them on the record. And they're damned if they do, damned if they don't. If they vote for the Green New Deal, every single GOP ad in 2020 is going to be about how Senator so-and-so voted to destroy American energy, to take away six million jobs in two seconds, and uh, destroy your house, outlaw your car, and your airplane. If they vote against the Green New Deal, then the left is going to go after them. The Ocasio-Cortez wing of the party is going to go after them. They're going to be seen as old fogies. They might get primaried. 
in 2020. It's a beautiful issue. And so when Cocaine Mitch, he always tries to hide his excitement, but he gives you a little wink. This is what he said. He said, quote, I've noted with great interest the Green New Deal, and we're going to be voting on that in the Senate. Give everybody an opportunity to go on record and see how they feel about the Green New Deal. It's just that little, it's like that gif of Cocaine Mitch just looking up, and then you just see that little smile creep across his face. I'm sure that's what he got when he was writing out that statement. Absolutely fabulous. How are the Democrats punching back? They've got nothing. So they're just punching back in the old way they always do. The, they're using the, uh, the mainstream media, of course. Uh, there was, at the Media Research Center, they found, I think, 33 TV shows in the past, I don't know, five minutes that have been calling Donald Trump a racist, a terrorist. It's, and, uh, it's great to kill babies. And they're just using the edifice that they have to do their best to push down Trump's popularity, push up Democrat popularity, here are their best efforts. Mike Pence's wife, Karen, or mother, as she's called during their BDSM late night kink sessions. Is Donald Trump racist? Duh. Trump is holding this country hostage. You don't deal with terrorists. <laughs> Mr. President, on the off chance that you aren't watching Judge Jeanine Pirro with your pants off right now. Suck it. He has turned the Republican Party into something different than it was when I started to run for president. Yeah, uh, no question. The Kremlin. I think it's a little premature to be the lamenting the death of our democracy. That is exactly what everyone said in those countries as human rights eroded. My greatest accomplishment? Oh, we didn't ask. Not getting AIDS from Roy Cohn. Oh, they're going, yeah, ha ha, see, ha 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 ha. President Trump's approval is at 52% in the only daily presidential tracking poll. So sad they did, but they, they had the fake John Stewart talk about how bad he is. But some guy on some sitcom that nobody watches, he said it's bad. It, uh, oh, just doesn't. Their power has just totally eroded. This would have been unthinkable 10 years ago. It really, w- this is a whole new ball game that we're in. And I think it's because so many people don't have cable. How many millennials do you know that actually have television? Not very many. Most millennials I know use the streaming services. Maybe they have their parents log in if they want to watch a special or a game or something on cable, which they also stream. But they just don't. So that power of the mainstream media just totally goes away. It just hasn't worked at least. And that's they used to have the whole edifice of the media. Now, even that does nothing for them. So now they're pushing this, this lie that President Trump has raised their taxes because it's tax season and the big story is being reported everywhere. Some people are finding that their tax refunds are lower than they expected. And this, so first of all, the, the basis of this story is some people on Twitter. That's it. It's not like there's some big study. It's not like there was a survey. No, there was some people on Twitter. This was enough to get the mainstream media riled up. But you might be asking yourself, wait a second, how is that possible? We know that Republicans lowered taxes last year. In fact, this was the big gripe. The big gripe against Trump last year from the Democrats is Republicans lowered taxes too much and now the government won't have enough of your money. That was the big gripe. And now they're saying the government has too much of your money. Ha ha, see? Ha ha, which is it? You got to pick a lane. Now, let's say, let's just do the hypothetical and say that you get less money in your tax refund this year. Your tax refund is not a gift from the government. It's not like every year at Christmas time, big daddy government says, well, ho, 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 how much did Johnny Smith deserve this year? Let's give him an extra $200. Ho, ho. No, the tax refund is your money. It's your money, which you gave in an interest-free loan to the federal government for a whole year. Ideally, you would not get a tax refund because the government wouldn't make you pay all of that money up front that you don't owe them. So that's just on the uh, basic front to begin. Uh, But on the second front, stop using some people on Twitter as as your basis, mainstream media, Other than a handful of people who did very well, people who make a decent amount of money in particular blue states where 
They're, ta- they're also taxed a lot at the municipal and the state level. Everybody's taxes went down. Every, that's, this is an empirical fact. To say otherwise is fake news. It's why we conservatives refer to these guys as fake news. So that one hasn't worked either. Unfortunately for the left, presidential approval is up. Everybody is uh, doing well except for Democrats over the past couple weeks. So now what Democrat presidential candidates are trying to do is to be likable. They can't run on policy. What policy can they run on? The Green New Deal, not going to play in Peoria. They can't really run on their records. Kamala Harris is ostensibly the front runner for the Democrats. Her entire career is as a prosecutor. She can't run as a prosecutor because Democrats hate law enforcement. They hate prosecutors. They're running against the cops. They want to abolish law enforcement. So you'll notice, if I weren't telling you this, you probably would have no idea If you're just a regular old American walking around, you listen to the news every so often, you would probably have no idea that Kamala Harris was a prosecutor for her entire career because she won't talk about it because she knows if she talks about it, it'll kill her in the primary. So now she's trying to be likable. You know, the, the generic Democrat, the generic Democrat could beat Donald Trump, I think, in 2020. Just the generic Democrat that you can just put all your hopes and dreams on. But there's no such thing as a generic Democrat. There's no such thing as a generic political candidate, period. Even Mitt Romney, who is the closest thing to generic that there is, is not generic. We saw that. They painted him as a guy who is mean to his dog. Didn't work out for him. Plus, he's also a snake who stabs his friends in the back and he's completely disloyal. So that's, that also helps when you're, or hurts rather when you're trying to be the generic guy that you can put your hopes and dreams on. So Kamala Harris, doing her best now to seem likable, see, I just want to prepare, just set your face in a cringe, because it's going to go there anyway, and I don't want it to scare you when your face just snaps into a cringe. So just start it out in a cringe and take a look at this. Also, and I know the answer to this too, they say you oppose legalizing weed. That's not true. I know. <laughs> and, and, and look, I joke about it, half joking, half my family's from Jamaica. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> They be so mad but, at you. Have you ever smoked? I have. Okay. Like in and I, or and I inhale. I did inhale. I did inhale. It was a long time ago. Now, but yes. I know you have to go. They say you have to go. I just, wanted to I just broke loose. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, was it in college? Or? Uh-huh. See, see, I like stuff like that. That's a real <laughs> honest answer. Uh-huh. Was it a blunt or joint? It was a joint. Hey. Yeah. Do you remember the high? <laughs> I do. So if it was legalized all throughout the country and <laughs> medicinal, would you, you know, do it? Listen, again? I think that it gives a lot of people joy, and we need more <laughs> joy. We need more joy in this world. <laughs> that laugh is like nails on a chalkboard. That laugh is so much worse than Hillary's laugh because it just she does. You can tell she does it a little bit when she's nervous, or she does it just to fill time, or and it's just to try to be likable. It's so awful. I don't. Maybe it's genuine. Doesn't matter. Either way, she has got to fix the laugh. That laugh is, so, I just, oh my like twitching when I hear it. It's worse than Hillary's. Also, we're a long way from I did not inhale. Remember Bill Clinton, in, a, in just a perfect example of a Clintonism, he was asked if he'd ever smoked pot. He said, I did smoke marijuana, but I did not inhale. Like, what? So are you an idiot? Do you not know? <laughs> when I was at Oxford, I was, you made it to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. You didn't know that the point of smoking pot is to inhale. So we've got a long way here. Now these politicians are going out of their way to say that they have smoked pot. And honestly, I'm not sure that I believe that Kamala Harris has ever actually smoked pot. I mean, like Maybe she has. I don't know. Probably, I guess. But she came out in the same interview. We don't have time to go through all of it. She said that she, she smoked pot while listening to Tupac and uh, Snoop Dogg in college. First of all, with the music, again, she's, con- she's trying to relate to people through these really b- basic things, these really lowest common denominator things, because she can't talk about her record. She can't talk about her professional life. So she's talking about music. She's talking, I mean, music is how little children relate to each other. This is how you make friends in middle school. She said, I like 
Eric Clapton. Oh, I like Eric Clapton. Okay, now we're friends. Oh, I like some really indie thing that you totally have never heard of. Oh, yeah, I, I really like that super indie thing too. Yeah, now that's, that's how little children talk to each other because it's extraordinarily shallow and inoffensive. So some people persist in this through college. Usually people grow out of it at some point. You, you relate to people and you become friends based on other things such as circumstances or mutual friends, sometimes a shared interest or activity or you're working together or something a little deeper than, you know, yeah, I really like that cool indie, uh, 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 you know. So that's, she's relating to people in the way that children relate to each other because she necessarily has to relate to people in a really sh- shallow way. One, because the deeper essence of her career is off the table now, it's off limits. And two, because her voters are shallow. They're just sh- I don't know how else to put it. They're shallow. They're thinking about politics in a shallow way. The Green New Deal, which she supports, could have been written in crayon. I'm, this is not just invective. This is not just ad hominem. The things she's talking about are really shallow, and that's why she launches her campaign on the mood mix and the music she listens to. This is, this is what she's doing here. But the trouble with this mood mix, the trouble with how she smoked pot in college and listened to Snoop Diggity Doodad and the other guy, Tupac, is that she graduated college in 1986, and uh, Tupac didn't come out with his debut album until 91, and Snoop Dogg didn't come out with his debut album until 93. And he didn't get acquitted on his uh, drive-by shooting charge until 97. I guess that's neither here nor there. It was 96. I forget. She couldn't have listened to these guys and smoked pot while in college. So it's two questions then. One, has she been just smoking pot for years, like after law school, and she's just really listening to Snoop and Tupac and all that? Or is she just faking it to try to seem likable? I actually think the more likely answer is the latter. I think this is the Hillary Clinton carrying hot sauce around line just on steroids. I think it's just a way higher up version of that. So things, things are so bad for Democrats this week that even fake, vichy, squishy, I'm a Republican, but I'm not that kind of a Republican. Fake conservatives are giving up on them. Even Steve Schmidt, whose entire life now, whose total career is just talking about how awful conservatives are, and how he wishes he weren't a right winger. Even Steve Schmidt walked off his own podcast because he has had it with the left this week. Does he really mean that a tax on incomes over $10 million at 70%, which is widely popular with the American people, is ridiculous? Is that an adult conversation? Yeah, I think he thinks it's ridiculous and it's confiscatory and that it's anti-growth. That would be his point. What is, will Derek Jeter or uh, another athlete not hit another home run because they're going to get taxed at 70? What's the economic behavior that he thinks it's anti-growth other than his own pocket? Adam, this is bull. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, you got to answer the question. I'm not. You got it, Steve. I'm not. I'm not. Oh. Unfortunately, the interview ended there. Yeah, it ended there. Oh, what, what beautiful schadenfreude, by the way. What a great way. This guy, Steve Schmidt, deserves everything he gets from his new friends on the left. Steve, he's just so unnecessarily catty and mean and backstabbing to his former conservative friends. He made his whole life working for Republicans. And the first chance he gets, he he says, no, no, I, I want to be with the cool kids. No, I want to be with the Democrats there. No, those conservatives are so bad. Ooh. So he deserves exactly what he gets for hanging around with these snakes because he's a snake himself. I'm really happy about that. I hope that he's a, a lesson to all conservatives to not be that guy. Remember who your friends are. Have a little self-respect. Have a little integrity. Have a little loyalty. And don't try to just virtue signal to a bunch of degenerates and try to say, no, please left, love me, love, I'm a good one, I'm the good one, they're the bad ones. So I really love that. But I love that even Steve Schmidt can't take them anymore. Steve Schmidt, I guess Schmidt is advising a, either Howard Schultz or a super PAC for Howard Schultz. And Howard Schultz is this moderate Democrat, kind of a center left, center right guy. And the left, he's, Steve Schmidt is learning the lesson in real time. Nothing is ever good enough for the left. You're just going to come and to appease them means they're going to eat you last. And he walked off. This is BS. Ha ha ha. Very pleased 
that Howard Schultz is seeing this, very pleased that Steve Schmidt is seeing this, very pleased that a lot of Democrats are seeing this. A great start to the week for conservatives, a really tough start for Democrats, and it's only Tuesday. Mm, join me tomorrow. I'll try to keep the levels in the cup down so we don't all drown. Come back again tomorrow. In the meantime, I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. See you then. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Robert Sterling. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. And our technical producer is Austin Stevens. Edited by Danny D'Amico. Audio is mixed by Dylan Case. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Olvera. Production assistant, Nick Sheehan. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2019.